Um, yeah, x86 is an interesting machine. Let me start my slides here. I've got 20 slides, um, which we'll go through fairly quickly. And then I want to show you some real stuff. So let's see, F5. Oh, wrong screen. F5 starts up slides. So here's basically what I'm going to do. Um, by the way, I, I kind of missed an opportunity this year just to um, backtrack for a moment. Uh, they canceled one of my courses that I normally teach in the fall. So I was given a choice of four different courses that kind of fit my time frame. And one of them was computer architecture, which I haven't taught in decades and certainly never here. Um, and I'd really like to teach it with the Raspberry Pi because it'd be fun to teach it with a real machine or better yet, x86. But they're pretty hung up on using the MIPS emulator and I didn't have time to uh, do a real um, you know, do a whole curriculum. Somebody came into my office hours. This is technically my office hours right now. Uh, so I decided to teach 2336 instead. And I know some of you are from 2336. Thanks for being here. Um, anyway, let's go back in, into x86 assembly um, because I'm a big fan of understanding all the details of how things really work, as you know. So we're gonna cover some the basic x86 register model if you don't understand the register model of a machine, it becomes a lot harder to deal with it, so you have to know that. We're going to talk about the instruction set some, but not all of it, because it's a really comprehensive instruction set. Uh, addressing modes, which is really important, um, and there are a lot of them on, on the x86, um, which get really complicated. Um, and then disassembling code, and I'll show you how to do that with, with a C program, C++ program. So here's what I assume you already know. If you don't know all of this, that's okay. You can pick up a lot from the talk because I will show quite a lot. Uh, but I expect that you know something about computer architecture, at least a little bit, uh, so you understand what I'm talking about when I say register model, for example. Uh, understanding a binary and hex, you pretty much have to, uh, because what I'm going to be showing you, you're gonna see a lot of hexadecimal. Uh, and the ability to program in C or C++, or both, um, because I'm going to show you some examples that start out in C++, and then we quickly descend into assembly code. Okay. So x86 architecture, um, these processors have many often complex instructions. Uh, they contain essentially two separate instruction sets, maybe three these days. Okay, the original x8086 instruction set uh, plus the extended 32-bit instructions. So, and the other thing that they contain is floating point, which is done on a separate processor. Uh, it used to be a separate chip that went on a board that you could buy, and then they integrated it all, starting with the 486. They integrated everything into one chip, and now the chip supports floating point native which is really cool. Um, it is a really cool floating point processor. Uh, unfortunately, that's a whole separate two hour talk. Um, amazingly powerful. It's got all your trig functions on the chip. So nobody has to write library routines anymore for trig. Uh, powers, you know, things like that, square roots. All of that is on the chip in hardware. Is that cool or what? I thought so. But then I have a weird idea of what is cool. Um, we also won't cover the x64 architecture, which is way more complex, way more interesting. Uh, I'm going to give you just a little bit of history, though. Um, long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, San Antonio, Texas, to be specific, uh, and long ago was 1970, 1969, I think, is when it started, um, a company decided that they were going to build a personal computer. Okay. It wasn't Apple. It was a company called Data Point Corporation in San Antonio. Um, and they did. And it was the very first one, but nobody gives them credit for it because they messed up and they're gone. Uh, but they designed the 8008 chip, 8008 chip for Intel. And it was too slow for their use. So they let Intel have it in exchange for the costs of developing it. 
Can we talk about one of the worst business decisions of all time? They're gone. Intel is a multi-trillion, a multi-billion dollar company. Oops. Um, but that's where all this stuff came from. So the 8008, 8088, 8086, on up into the current Intel IA64 chips. Um, so all of that is has a common ancestor, and it's in San Antonio. Okay. Cisc versus risk. These are not risk machines. If you understand risk machines like the MIPS or the Raspberry Pi, this will look wildly different. Uh, I personally prefer Cisc machines because the instructions do a lot more for you per clock. The idea behind risk was, well, let's have just a few instructions and make everything else a combination of them uh, and make them run really fast. That idea came about when? About 1989, 90, 95, maybe latest time frame. Uh, pushed by IBM, but with as many transistors as you can get on a die today, there's no point in having a risk machine, my opinion. Um, and they do a lot in relatively few cycles. I will show you some of this as we go forward. So finally, real stuff, register model. So the, the 8-bit 8008 or 8080 registers, also 8008, A, B, C, D, and E. They're letters, okay? Only five of them. When the 8086 came out, a, the A, B, C, D, E existed still, but now they were extended. So AX was a 16-bit register, BX and so forth. So these were 8-bit registers, these were 16-bit registers. Um, so the 8-bit counterparts were AH, the high bit of AX, and AL, the low bit of a, AX, and so forth. Uh, with the 8086, they added two additional index registers, which made a lot of sense, the source and the destination. That's what SI and DI, source index and destination index. The other problem that we saw, because I did a lot of programming on 8088s and 8080s and, uh, I'm sorry, 8080s, 8086s, Z80s, was addressing. Um, these were 16-bit machines, meaning that they had 16 address pins. If you really look at it, that's not much. It seemed like a lot in the late 1970s when a lot of this stuff was happening, or mid 1970s when a lot of this stuff was happening. Uh, it's not very quickly became a huge limitation, uh, especially as memory got cheap. So what they did was they said, well, we've only got these 16 bit registers. SI and DI are also 16 bit registers. Let's have a segment register. And what the segment register does is it extends the addressing to 20 bits. So you use 16 bits of the, D, so let's say the DS, the data segment register, but it's really a 20 bit register with the low four bits as zero. So if you use, let's say BX as an index with DS, DS colon BX, what you're doing is you're adding 20 bits of the data segment to the 16 bits of BX and using that as an offset. Um, I'm gonna trust, let, let's show of hands though. Um, I understand pointers in C++ really well. Show of hands, please. Are you all allowed to raise your hand in here? Cause I'm not seeing any hands go up. And I know some of them do. Uh, professor, um, uh, some of our hands are raised. Oh, okay. I see exactly one, but maybe there are more. Um, there. I know this stuff's been lagging. Grace? And David, it's good to see you in here. I, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for this talk. Good. Okay. Uh, well, I don't see any more hands than yours, but I'm going to assume then that at least a lot of you. So what I'm, when I'm talking about an address and an offset and so forth, all of this stuff uh, is addresses contained in registers. So these are essentially pointers. Uh, and I'll show you some of this as we go forward with the instruction set. Um, and then the stack registers. So there's a stack pointer, which is 16 bits. So you can have a 64K stack and a, and a stack segment, 
Oh, I'm sorry, stack BP is, is also another stack pointer that you can use for offsets. SS was the stack segment. Uh, CS is the code segment. So what, what you can have then is 64K of code in a segment, 64K of data, non-overlapping. Uh, so what this ended up doing was it gave you one megabyte of addressability, which today one megabyte isn't much, is it, right? But it was huge compared to 64K. Okay. And then the 286 expanded on that and gave you, I think, I don't remember, another four bits, I think. So uh, 16 megabyte addressing. And then it went on from there. And of course, today's in processors, 64 bit processors, give you 64 bit addressing, which is Oh, probably more money than you'll be able to afford for another five years. Okay. So continuing. 32-bit registers, 80, 386 and later, EAX, extended A extended, EBX and so forth. These are now 32-bit indexes, extended stack pointer and base pointer. And they added some more segment registers, extra F and G. Okay, I'm not going to really go too far into the 386 and later instructions. Uh, we can do an awful lot with just the 16-bit set or the 32-bit set with the original segment registers. Okay. There's also status flags in, in any processor. So overflow result exceeds positive or negative limit of the number range. Um, so you add two giant numbers and they overflow, the overflow flag will get set, which is unfortunate that you can't test it in most programs, um, which is another reason to understand assembly code. Uh, the sign, the result is negative. So if the sign bit is true, the result is negative by the way the status flags are saved in a register. Um, zero, result is zero. So you subtract something from itself or XOR something with itself the zero flag will be set. You add one to zero, the zero flag is not set. Carry, this gets used a lot in certain operations. Carry out of the most significant bit of a result. So for example, um, you add two large numbers and you get um, a result and the carry flag is set. Now you know, oh, okay, well they overflowed and it's different from overflow but there was a carry that then you can add into the next number. So you can essentially do very large arithmetic operations by using this carry flag. Uh, auxiliary carry, um, we don't use much. Carry out of position three used for BCD. Uh, and then parity, the low byte of a result has an even number of bits set, which can be very handy as well. So all of these are status flags. Uh, I think the newer architectures have even a couple of more. I don't remember what they are. Irrelevant for our talk. Uh, believe me, we're going to cover quite a lot as it is. Okay. The instruction format then, and this is a variable length instruction. Um, so it has a prefix, which is optional, um, an opcode, which is required. Some things have only an opcode, not very many. Register specifier, some the things that have only an opcode, for example, assume or register, don't use any at all. Uh, the uh, scale index base byte, which again is optional. The displacement, which is an offset from a base pointer, which we'll see, and, and or immediate operands. And I'll show you a lot of this stuff as we move forward. So everyone with me so far, questions? Are we good? I'm going to assume, since I don't see anything in chat. And by the way, feel free to use chat. Uh, I'm, I'm watching chat, so if you have questions and you want to chime in there, that's fine. Uh, or unmute, although try not to interrupt me in the middle of something. Okay. So machine instruction format. And again, once we look at real instructions, I'll, you'll see more of this. Okay. So obviously all operations affect the state of the processor. Some affect it more than others. 
for example, there is an instruction called no op, no operation. It does nothing. You might think, why would you have such an instruction? Uh, timing is one reason, or for that instruction to be replaced by another instruction, also an interesting thing. So you can have self-modifying code. Uh, so, but they affect the state of the processor. In that case, does nothing, but the program counter moves one byte. Uh, most have at least one operand, explicit or implicit, that gets changed. Uh, register, um, a memory location, something, status flags, something changes in the processor. And all of this, by the way, if you remember your digital logic or something related to it, some of you have taken it, some of you have not, uh, all of this can be done with NAND gates, right? Is that cool or what? One specific gate and you can build an entire processor with all of these um, kinds of instructions that will do amazing things for you, okay? Oh, okay, I'm seeing... Um, Some comments. Okay, good. Good. Okay. Um, so, immediate, where the operand is contained in the instruction, and I will show you an example in a moment. In a register, so you can add, for example, two registers, or you can add something, an immediate operand to a register. Memory, very important, right? Being able to modify memory or an I.O. port, which we won't cover at all. Those are pretty esoteric. Okay, so implicit operands and explicit operands, some instructions like AAM, that's ASCII adjust for multiply, where what it does is it takes the result of a multiplication and uh, adjusts it to, for binary code a decimal, very complex instruction. Uh, always operate on the same register, either AX or EAX in 32-bit set. Um, most require you specify the operands like exchange EAX comma EBX. Look at this one though, this is interesting. Exchange, so what it does in one instruction, and I forget how many clocks it is, it's probably three clocks, exchanges the contents of these two registers. Uh, the other thing that this exchange instruction can do is exchange the contents of two memory, lo I think it can do two memory locations. I know it can do two a register and memory. Um, so the swap that you do in bubble sort, you can do with one instruction. Oh, is that cool or what? Uh, push AX have both, so it has an explicit and an implicit instruct, uh, register. So pu you're pushing AX on the stack, but it's also modifying the stack pointer. So it explicitly puts AX on top of the stack, implicitly changes the stack pointer and the contents of a memory location. Um, okay, so a lot of them have implicit operands like arithmetic instructions that change the contents of flags. Uh, the implicit operand is the flag that's being changed like carry or zero, so forth. Okay, with me so far? Let me just stop for a moment and show you, because I have a C++ program up. There we go. Okay. One of the things that I've done here is I've used the underscore ASM, and then I've actually given you machine instructions. And I'll show this more later, but you can do this. You can go right into assembly code within C++, especially if you're using Visual Studio. Uh, which understands x86 assembly and have machine instructions. So move EAX comma one, move the one to the extended AX register, 32-bit AX register, and then shift it left to bit positions. So this has the effect of multiplying by four. Okay, so what should happen is we should end up with four in EAX. And we'll walk through this in the debugger when I show you disassembly and you'll see exactly how a lot of this stuff works. But uh, for those of you who've been in my classes, for me to go 20 whole minutes without showing code is pretty much a record, right? Um, I know, Harry, you haven't been in a programming class with me. I appreciate you being here, but some of you have, so you know what I'm talking about. Okay. 
So let's see, operands. Uh, so for most instructions, one of the two explicitly specified operands must be, may be in either a register or memory. The other operand must be in a register or must be immediate. So that gives you then register to register, register to memory, memory to register. So move can go from memory to register, register to memory, for example. So you can move stuff in and out of memory and immediate to register and immediate to memory. So that move EAX comma one is a move immediate to register. Um, you can do this though. Let's go back to my, my code. I think I got this right. Um, notice I have this variable X up here. That variable is known to the assembly code. Okay. So most of the assembly code I've written, I, I haven't worked for, with from C++. I've just written it from nothing, uh, starting with assembly. But it's a lot easier to deal with here. But when I did that, that was memory constraints. So some instructions use data from within the instruction as one or sometimes two of the operands. Uh, for example, maybe a byte word or double word. SHR, that's shift right, shifts the EA contents of the EAX register right to two bits. It's equivalent to a divide by four. Integer multiply, look at this one. Sh uh, multiplies the contents of mem word by three and puts the result in CX. So there's three operands essentially this is an immediate, this is a memory location, this is the CX register. Uh, so it's a 32 bit or 16 by 16 bit multiply um, and has a 32 bit result. Um, the other interesting thing is notice that there's no segment specified. That's because the, for this, since it's data, a memory address, the DS, the data segment is assumed, but you could change it, you could modify it. Okay. So memory models, this gets really furry on the later chips, but we'll talk about them anyway. Um, so the memory models, flat memory model maps different logical segments to one physical address space. Uh, all segment registers map to the same place in physical memory. So what this does is it gives you addressability to the entire machine, which um, really is a nice way of doing things rather than having all these segments floating around and having to deal with them. The only thing I didn't like about it was protecting specific memory locations then, uh, which you can do better with segments. That's again way beyond the scope of this talk. Um, so the separate segmented memory model as opposed to the flat model maps different logical segments to different address space and physical memory. So for example, if I have the, the DS register, that will map to specific places in physical memory, but it will be different from wherever the SS, for example, points, the stack segment. Um, so the segment registers hold 16-bit pointers in the uh, to a, a table in memory. It used to be that they were the address themselves. Now they are pointers to a table in memory that holds the base address of the segment and other information. And some of that other information is whether it's, for example, writable or executable. Um, one of the hacks that, and this is great for a computer security group, uh, was that you put code into the data segment illegally, but you would find a way to have code in the data segment. And then you would simply jump to that code. And of course that code would be malicious code. Uh, if you know what you're doing with, within the operating system, you set the data segment for read and write, but instruction fetch is prohibited by using the segment table. And so now, uh, doesn't matter what you put in the data segment, it can never be executed. Is that cool? And that's in pretty much every modern processor. It was definitely not in the earliest ones that I worked on up to the 386. Okay. 
So segment register, segment selection, excuse me. Uh, you can optionally specify a segment. Uh, if you don't, following rules apply. Uh, instructions use the instructions, should say instructions, use the CS register. So that's where the, the instructions are fetched from. Uh, the stack uses the SS, stack segment. Local data uses the data segment, DS register. And the destination for some string instructions, like move a repeated move, for example, uses the extra segment. You can point ES and DS at the same place and just work within one segment, but this gave you a way to move stuff between segments, which was really nice. Uh, you can also use segment override prefixes, except for instruction fetch, the stack, or destination strings. You have to use the data, the DS or the CS or the uh, SS for those. Okay. With me so far? Let me check. Okay. Don't have a lot of construction. Uh, so somebody has something for the 6502. Yeah, that was a cool chip. I have a book on it up here that I've pl played with a little bit. Um, no, I don't. I have the 68000, which was its successor. Yeah, 6502 was really cool. Um, anyway. So um, let's see. Effective address computation. This is where pointers get really interesting. This byte in the, that is uh, within some of the instructions, a lot of them, provides the most flexible form of addressing. I don't remember what mod RM stands for. Uh, but instructions that have the byte after the opcode are most common in x86 instruction set. There are a lot of them that allow this. Uh, for memory operands specified in this mode, the offset within the selected segment is the sum of, get this, three components. A displacement, which is maybe immediate or it may be in a register, base register, and an index register, which may, may be multiplied by a factor of two, four, or eight. And the mod RM byte tells you what factor. So if you're working with 16-bit operands, then it's two. 32-bit, it's four. 64-bit operands, then you're multiplying by eight which is really, of course, shifting one two, or one, two, or three bits. Okay. So here you have then the addressing modes again, only in a little more detail. Displacement off of some segment. Base. Base plus displacement. Index times scale plus displacement. Base plus index plus displacement. So an index register, a displacement, and a, and a segment, essentially. Base plus index times scale plus displacement. So this gives you some real flexibility uh, and real power, right? Because you can kind of see that if you want to uh, address something, load, load data from somewhere, uh, or say index through an array, Indexing through an array would be really useful with the base index times scale plus a displacement. Uh, and then you just keep incrementing the index register by one, but because you're multiplying it by the scale factor, now you don't have to remember, oh, I'm working with double words, I'm working with 16-bit uh, quantities. You just increment the index by one and it scales it for you. Is that cool or what? Okay. So data element sizes, um, byte, 8-bit quantity, signed or unsigned, 16-bit quantity for a word, usually signed, and then a double word, 32 bits, again, usually signed. So, and then, of course, in the later architectures, you have 64-bit quantities, the Q word, quad word. Okay. I'm almost ready to start showing you code. Questions so far? Are we good? Okay. And a lot of this will make more sense once you see um, how the instructions actually look and work. Okay. And by the way, um, a lot of the source code for some of this stuff, uh, and some of it's in assembly code, but for example, this run, the C runtime stuff is all here. Uh, so for example, if I put this, whoops, um, 
if I actually go to this location on my machine where I have Visual Studio 2019 installed, um, I can find the, the source code for the C runtime. And you can see exactly how they do it. Uh, so every hacker should know where that is. OK. So I'm going to talk about instruction set now, but I'm not going to put it in the slides. Before I move on, though, I want to show you something else that's interesting. I found this site not too long ago. Uh, it's from the Un University of Virginia, and it's a pretty good x86 assembly guide. Um, shows, you, and I like the graphics here. Yes? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I've read that. It's nice. You've seen this? Yeah. Yeah, this is good. And I like the graphic of the extended AX, AX, AH, AL, uh, and so forth. So, and the ESI, EDI, and so forth, which are the 16 or 32 bit equivalents. So, yeah, this is a really good one to look at. Um, and they explain the addressing modes pretty well. Uh, the, where I got most of my material was out of uh, Intel. Uh, books that I have, actual physical books that I have on my shelf back here. So let's see. Yeah, they're good, aren't they? The Intel software developer manuals are very good. But this, again, is a, a good simplified. Um, so for example, um, what this does, um, let's use this before I go into the code that I've developed and play with and disassembly. Um, the dot data declaration says that this is part of a data segment. So these are data declarations, DB64 define byte, and it contains uh, a value 64, uninitialized byte, var2. X define word, so it's a, a two byte quantity, 16 bit, uh, double word, 32 bit quantity, and there is now a DQ quad word that you can either initialize or not. Um, there's also this dupe here says, give me uh, 10 uninitialized bytes starting at location bytes, and so DB10 dupe. And then question mark says nothing in it. The dupe of zero says that you have 100 bytes initialized to zero. OK. So and these this shows you indexed ad addressing, for example, like this one move EAX. So this is the destination. The source is not the EBX register. Because it's in brackets, it is wherever EBX points. It's the address in EBX. So here, if we had just didn't have the brackets, we would say move EAX comma without the brackets EBX. It would move the contents of the EBX register, not the memory location pointed EBX. So welcome to pointers, the way you, you should learn them. Okay, here, move the contents of EBX into the four byte memory address var. So this is a 32-bit constant. Uh, so it's an actual address. OK. Um, move EAX ESI minus 4. So move 4 bytes at memory address ESI plus. So we're essentially taking something that's in the data segment, pointed to by the source index register, ESI register, and moving it into this EAX register. 32 bits again, four bytes. So, but let's look at disassembly because disassembly is one of the things that I know all of you are interested in. And it's also something that you should know about just on principle. There's no really good way to disassemble Intel code because of the variable length instructions. But if you can get into the debugger, and you can debug one of these things. Like, let, let's take this little example. Um, well, let's just do F5. Yeah. 
there's no easy way to write a disassembler because of the variable length instruction set. So you, yes, you can go to the entry point, but it's very hard to figure out what the next thing is, whether it's an actual instruction data, what it is. So yeah, it's, there are some disassemblers, but they don't work very well. And that's the reason. Um, okay. This is just a little test program that I had. Um, so I've given it one. This is binary I.O. program that I wrote that I decided to modify for our purposes. One of the things, though, that you can do. Um, oh, Ghidra. OK, that's good to know. I haven't seen that one. OK. Um, view. one of these windows here, other windows, somewhere in here is disassembly. I thought it was under view. I should have done this before. It's been a little while since I've done this. It's Windows. Data Tools. Where is it? Am I missing something, folks? This used to be here. Oh, Debug Windows Disassembly. Sorry. Okay, there we are. Okay. So here we are in disassembly. And you can see that int x assign 5, move D word pointer EBP minus 24 hex comma 5. Oh, okay, let's parse what that's doing exactly. Um, by the way, I have two monitors here. The camera is on the one on the left, which is actually on, on a laptop. The second monitor is the one you get to see, and that's to my right. So move D word pointer EBP. So this is an, an address. And notice EBP, this is not the stack pointer, this is the stack base pointer, minus 24 hex. So in, within the stack frame, the variable X is at this offset, it's 24 bytes before, so the stack actually builds down. Uh, so the, the pointer points to the bottom of the stack frame. And then uh, we offset 24 bytes from the bottom of the stack frame up into the local variables. Okay, and then we move the, the immediate operand five. Okay. So this is what the, the int x assign five generates and D word pointer, double word meaning 32 bit quantity. Okay, so uh, if we look at that memory location, uh, let's see what that is. Well, if we just do this address of X, we're going to see before we execute it, it's uninitialized memory. Um, I've been working in Java too much. What is my uh, I think it's step over. Yeah, it's F10. Okay. And now you see that these memory addresses, memory locations contain five followed by four bytes of zero. This is another artifact of the original architectures. Um, they are stored little endian. Some of you know what little endian means. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, uh, this might be a little hard to read for some of you. Okay, so little endian 
means that the low order byte is stored first and the high order bytes. So this is the highest order byte uh, of this variable. Okay. So, and this is an artifact again of the original x80 or I'm sorry, 8008 architecture, which had 14 address lines and only eight data lines. No, it had eight address lines that were latched. So you would get the first byte of the address, then the second byte latched on on the from on off the chip hardware. Um, so you would get the low order byte first, which they kept, unfortunately, even in later architectures, and it has carried through to this day, which is unfortunate. Um, okay. So let's look. Uh, I also have this little arithmetic expression. Um, so move EAX word pointer. So this, remember, was X times two. Move ECX um, okay. And then load if they use the load effective address to do the multiplication, ECX plus EAX times two. So essentially we're loading the same thing into these registers and then adding them. Okay. Um, rather than do a multiply. And then we move the D the value back into the variable C. So let's look at this then. Address of C. Okay. And watch what happens when I press F10. It changes magically here. Okay. To hex F, which of course is 15. Or, yeah, 15. So X times two, five times two plus five is 15. Yes, most days. Okay, so you can see exactly what's happening. Um, if we go up a little bit, you can see what's going on here. For example, C in into ANS. So move, we get the stack pointer into SI because we're gonna be using the, the uh, SI register to move stuff. Load effective address of the variable ANS push that on the stack, move ECX from the, with the address essentially of the uh, C in function, uh, call the function, and I'm not sure why they do a compare of these two things because they're not really using it, uh, well maybe they are. So they're calling RTC check ESP uh, to make sure that we got a valid value back, okay? And again, that's where you'd have to figure out what the functions really do, okay? So it gives you a sense of what assembly code looks like. Writing this stuff is painful, uh, but I've done it. I don't recommend it, uh, not unless you have a semi-infinite supply of caffeine handy. Um, Let's see, what else can I show you? So C out, um, where did I drop into assembly code? Yeah, here we do, go. Uh, underscore ASM, move EAX comma one. So these instructions here are essentially what I'm just, what my own assembly code. So move EAX comma one, moves one into EAX, shift left, two, uh, so let's put a breakpoint here, and I'm going to hit F5. We're going to end up at the breakpoint. So EAX, if we look at that right now, contains some fairly large value. F10, now EAX contains one. Okay. Shift left, you can imagine what's going to happen. EAX is going to contain four. What? Why four? Oh, two, I shifted it two, so it contains four. Okay, not one. Okay. Um, move D word pointer EBP. So this is the X variable. So I'm going to show you, remember the X contains five right now. 
but now after the execution of this operation, it should contain whatever is an EAX, extended AX register, so F10, and lo and behold, it's four. Okay, so this will give you a flavor for what assembly code can do. Um, why it did some of this, and then of course, this move. The rest of this stuff, though, is set up for whatever is in case one. Uh, so I'm not sure. Let's go back to the non disassembled version, binary IO. Um, oh, that's part of the switch. So the rest of that code is part of the switch statement. Okay. Questions, comments, anything so far? Okay. But notice then what we can do here. Um, I guess last time I gave this talk, there were a lot more questions, a lot more interaction because I went way, well, 10 minutes over. Um, but notice the way a lot of these things work. Um, switch, okay, case one. So load effective address of, some, of the uh, string. Okay, so the string is stored here. Let's do this. Um, EBP minus 60. Let's see if we can put that in here. Okay. Um, doesn't look right. So what it should be doing is it should be showing us a string in memory. Uh, unable to evaluate. Yeah, no, the string is a literal. So essentially what we're doing is um, this is what's being um, because these three instructions are loading the address, calling the C in or the, the C out function, and then uh, setting a result back to zero which there isn't really a result, okay. I don't think it needs to be constructed. Um, I think that the literal, let, maybe that is what's happening. Let's try a couple quick things here. Um, Okay, maybe it's constructed the string now. Um, oh, okay, that's, yeah. Um, D word pointer, okay. Oh yeah, okay, this is offset string, enter file name. So, and that's at FEB090H. So let's look at that. Here we go, there's the string I'm looking for, because you're right, that was the string constructor being called, not the C out. Sorry about that. Thanks, David. Good catch. Okay, so here's the string literal in memory, and we have the exact address. And I know in today's world, um, it's a little odd to think that these are actually, these are places in memory. Um, these are actual places where Stuff is stored on those chips that are in your computers that you buy and put into the 
slots in the machine. Uh, but this tells us exactly where it is. Not that you can actually see any of it, which we could sometimes, those days are gone. Um, so, but you can see how this works. We push the address of enter file name. Uh, we move EAX with uh, the address of the C out routine, push that. Um, no, what we're doing, I think, we're not pushing. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah, what we're doing is we're pushing operands on the stack and then um, when we return, we have to add to get past those operands. Okay, so we add the stack eight to the stack pointer to move past two single word operands. So it's kind of an interesting thing to see how they did their function calls. For example, you can see exactly what the function call signature is. And of course, if you were a malicious hacker, instead of making this point to this function, you could make it point to your own and do whatever you want, right? So I'll give you some sense of uh, being able to get inside of code. Now, I don't know, and I haven't tried this, whether I could actually change some of this code on the fly or not, um, but it would be interesting to try. Let's see if we can do this. Particularly true for V tables. Yeah, other pointers to functions indeed, uh, where you could change the, the pointers. Uh, for example, one of the th ways that switch sometimes works, switch case, is that it has a table, a jump table essentially that's offset. And so it searches for the thing and then just jumps to an offset within the table. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of ways of doing that. Um, let's see, we're at FE0042. Let's go to the 003A. So this is the actual instruction. Um, so move EAX. And again, I don't know my opcodes anymore, but it looks like this would be the opcode for move EAX comma one, because here's the one, the literal immediate operand one. So 3A, so this is 3A, B, C, D, E, and then the next instruction at E at F. So S H L E A X comma two, E A X comma two, uh, and that's two byte instruction. And then there's the two. Okay. So let's see if I can change this though. Okay. It let me do it. Interesting. So if we came back and executed this instruction again, um, it would move it into four. So it would just modified code. And apparently it wasn't protected, which is odd. Okay. So, but does this give you a flavor for what assembly code is like? And what you can do with it once you really understand how the machine works. Uh, I've got five minutes, so this might be a good, uh, yeah, RWX, <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, it's very low level. Um, I can show you one other thing that is very low level as well. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. I know where it is. Uh, I think I put it under admin. Yeah, this is a record IO routine that I wrote. Um, read and write. So this was text file read and write in assembly code. Let's see, when did I write that? April 4th, 1984. So this is a pretty old code. This is 16 bit code, not 32 bit 8086 code but you can get an idea of how painstaking this stuff is. And of course you have includes um, and these includes were all stuff that I wrote. The, these were not library includes. Okay, so there's 
Um, getting a, a record and so forth. Um, let's see, my favorite was when I had a ver version of NASM that didn't know how to assemble a specific type of jumps. So I had to just DB that instruction in my code, ouch. <laughs> yeah. So this was a fairly lengthy routine, not horrible. Well, 324, 323 lines, okay. I had commented stuff out because I learned things um, and modified things. Oh, I know this went from ver DOS version 1.1 to 2.0. That's why some of this stuff got commented out. Okay, so questions, we've just got a minute or two left, but that's most of what I wanted to show you tonight. Is this something you wanna follow up on? See if you can play with this? I hope some of you do. Yes, yes, yes. Good. Um, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, I wouldn't want to do this level of stuff all the time anymore. Um, but as, as something to, to know about, I highly recommend it. Um, just really good stuff to, to I'll give you an example about oh, seven or eight years ago, one of the other professors uh, sent out a uh, very small routine using a while loop. And he said something, asked, you know, which is more efficient? And he had two different codings. Um, and so what I did was I just disassembled them both and found out that, okay, the first one is more efficient on the basis that it takes one instruction less and because it uses better addressing modes, and it was written in C, by the way, um, uses better addressing modes. So it's actually two, four cycles, machine cycles faster than the other one. <laughs> okay. And I think he was very surprised that anybody bothered to look at it at that level at all. Um, but it was kind of fun. And you know, if you're working with embedded code, especially where, where cycles count, speed really counts, microseconds count, then it's really handy to know this stuff. And I've worked at that level more than once and it's really helped. Okay, anything else? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, David. Uh, will, there be, um, will there be any specific topics you're interested in presenting? that I'm interested in presenting? Um, well, this is the big one I've been asked to on security. Um, I mean, if you're going to follow up on x86. I, I'm sorry, following up on x86? Well, is um, you just mentioned? I don't know why I'm having a hard time hearing you or understanding, because there might, might be an echo in the back. Um, come say again, please. Um, you, you were mentioning having a follow-up talk on this, and some people were interested in that, including me. What kinds of topics might you want to uh, present? Uh, one of the things we might want to look at is protected mode on, say, the IA64, or how the segment tables really work. Things like that might be interesting. Um, you know, I don't know. You know. We could do a lot of different things. All right, I look forward to whatever you present. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, because the newer instruction sets are even more complicated and more interesting. Uh, X64, which I haven't really gotten into much, uh, has a lot more in it. Uh, floating point unit would be another interesting one to explore. Spend a half an hour or so exploring the floating point unit. Uh, but again, from a security standpoint, I think this is much more interesting, being able to see this stuff and see especially disassembly uh, is far more interesting. Professor Cole, what's, if anyone else wants to uh, ask further questions, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Um, probably email would be the best um, or on here on Teams. So, you know, just John, I think it's my net ID. So JXC064000. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you can find me very easily.
So yeah, very easy to find me. Cool. Uh, and I and if there are other, are there any resources you try and point other people to if they wanted to learn more, kind of to uh, dig deep into um, assembly? Well, this is a good one as an in introduction. Um, here, let me put this one in the in here. So this guide is a pretty good one. Um, then let's see, let me go back. I think I did another search on, yeah, Intel, of course, go back, go directly to the source. So here's their software developer's manual. Uh, we used to have to pay to buy this stuff. And now here it is online. Um, God knows how many pages, but for example, instruction set, uh, reference V through Z. Instruction set reference A through L. So tons of resources, all basically free. Uh, and of course, you can write assembly code using Visual Studio, which for you is free. Okay, so let me put this reference in as well. But yeah, 64 and IA32, um, Intel architecture, IA. So, and these are very helpful to put it mildly, um, but they give you, here's your instruction format, prefixes, mod RM, um, and so forth. Okay. So, but yeah, the original opcodes were all uh, one byte opcodes, and then of course they ran out of single byte numbers. <laughs> so then they had to move. The other thing, and I didn't get into, but like for example, the move instructions can have a prefix that causes them to repeat. So you can move large chunks of memory around very easily and quickly. Um, just lots and lots of stuff in there. Uh, there's instructions to support multi threading, single instructions that help you support multi threading. So lots, you know, it's, really amazing little machines for what they are. Yeah, x87 floating point can be cool. Um, I liked it. I was actually impressed with the architecture the first time I saw it. It's a stack is what it is. Uh, so you put the two oper operands on the stack and then you apply an operator to them if it's a binary operator. If it's a unary operator, it applies to the top thing on the stack, puts the new result back on the stack. Um, but I was just, I was impressed when I saw it, how it worked, because I had to program it at one point. So, okay, anything else? I need to get ready for my 830. Okay, well, thanks for having me. Uh, this has been fun. I hope you've enjoyed it, gotten something out of it. And I stopped sharing. Um, so yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Professor Cole. It is a pleasure, John. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Take care. I'm going to leave now. And, Take care. Uh, enjoy your evening. Bye.